Okay. Today's class focuses on Megillus Eicha, Pedic Aleph, Pasuk Tazayin, Chapter 1, Verse 16. And in many ways, it is a continuation of what we began last week. And in many ways, it is not a continuation. So let's first start off in uh, learning it as it is a continuation. A brief reminder, last week we studied verse 15, in which we talked about the protectors of Jerusalem being stripped away, uh, an appointed time or an army that was massed against us, and the loss of our young. Lishber Bachurai, all the young men were broken, destroyed, murdered, and Hashem allows the young maidens to be to blood to flow like from a wine press. Pretty horrible stuff. And verse 16 then continues, Al Eile Ani Boichia. It is for this that I weep. Eini, Eini Yordomayim. My eyes, my eyes, they flow with tears. They overflow with tears. Huh? It's a good question. Okay, very good, many. Question one, it says, I'm weeping for these, so why do you have to talk about the eyes that are weeping? Good question. We'll get to that. Let's just go through the verse once, and then we'll analyze the verse in detail. Because Menachem, the comforter, who is going to restore my soul, is very far away. My children were forlorn because the enemy had prevailed. Okay, so let's, let's learn this verse piece by piece and try to understand it. For these I weep. So you take a look, for example, in the Targum. And the Targum, instead of you saying the word Eila, instead of wording for these, the Targum lists details. Pretty uh, graphic details. Taflaya de Israchu, babies who are crushed. Or, or, or literally, like, rubbed out. Neshaya ma'adayasa the isbaku, pregnant woman who are ripped open. Horrible stuff. This is, this is, this is what, what the, the prophet foresees. This is what Yirmiyahu is seeing. He's seeing these horrific images. And he says, al-eila ani So I'm weeping for this. Eini, eini, yordamayim. My, my eyes are, are overflowing with tears. In the in words of the Hatamim, the Rabbeinu Avram Ibn Ezra, although there are some who maintain that this commentary was not actually written by the Ibn Ezra, anyway, it's called the Hatamim Ibn Ezra. He says, Amra Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, who is Besulas Bas Yehudo, who is metaphorically the maiden of Judah. She says now, it's as if the, like a soliloquy, a, a voice of the city. The city of Yerushalayim weeps, and the city of Yerushalayim speaks or gives ear, and it says, Al harois shehizkarti ani on all these horrible things that have been mentioned, that's what I'm crying for. Okay? A city is destroyed. Its youth is murdered. Jewish blood flows like, like wine, like wi- a wine press. Alayla ni There's a, a terrible medrash. It's actually in the bottom of your, of your copies about a time in this second base, first base Hamigdash that the Jewish people probably the second base of Megas actually, were in hiding in a cave. They were starving. There was no food. And the Romans were looking through like cave after cave, snuffing out the lives of Jews. This is not unlike the Holocaust years. Very, very similar imagery. And, and this, this, the Medrash tells about people used to go forage for food and they would literally eat the flesh off corpses. And the Medrash tells a horrible story about a man who was sent. He was chosen to go out there just like these partisans that to go and try to find some food and he found the corpse and he realized it's his own father so he quickly buried his father and he came back and he said I couldn't find anything today a little while later somebody else goes out and he smells flesh and he finds his fresh grave and he digs up this grave and in the dark everybody's I mean it's too horrible to think of and then the man realizes he's his own, own father so, so the medr says Al-Eila Ani Baychia it's for these terrible images. It's for this suffering, for this harrowing, horrible circumstances. I weep. And there are different midrashim that describe all kinds of awful things that happened during the time of the Chorban. So, so here's the thing. What's so Jewish about that? We are not the only people 
who was vanquished. We're not the only nation who was ripped apart. We're the only nation who comes back time and again. Other nations are ripped apart and they're gone. But we're not the only nation who suffered. Like, what's so Jewish? He's weeping, he's crying because of sad things that happen. You don't have to go into antiquity. Just take a look at the Yazidis, what they've been through, with ISIS, with these monsters in the, in the Middle East. Women raped, murdered, people eaten alive, burned. I mean, the, the, this is like, it's unbelievable that it's happening in, in the 21st century. And the Western governments are doing nothing. And today everybody sees it. It's on everybody's Facebook feed. It's in the news. So you think, you think that these people are suffering less? I don't know. I don't, I, don't, you, it's, it's not, it's, I don't know. I don't know how you measure away one suffering or the other suffering. Images of people being beheaded, images of people being burnt alive. So, so, the, so bad things happen. And so, I'm asking the question: Isn't there something more profound? Isn't there something maybe more Jewish here that that we're supposed to be focusing on? So, here's my, here's what I would like to say. And, and I'm pretty sure that I'm saying to you is not a chiddush. It's not really novel. It really it's implicit. Although I didn't actually see it the range this way, but I'm, I'm pretty sure, and you'll see. So on these words, aleila ni bechia, there is a, a chilling story in the Gemara. The Gemara is found in Mesechas Gitten. It's it's called Perik Hanizarkin, and over there the Gemara has several pages which speak about the Churban. On Daf Nun Ches, on page fifty eight. The Gemara begins to tell a story. In the beginning, the, the first uh, narratives of the Gemara are bloodshed and murder. And then the Gemara changes. The Gemara doesn't speak about bloodshed and murder. The Gemara speaks about mental and emotional torture. The Gemara speaks actually about sexual abuse in, in great detail. It's the first time, I believe, ever, this is documented in history, the, the acknowledgement of what, what a terrible reality this is, even though you know, it's only become part of the public consciousness in, in recent years. So the Gemara tells a story. Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha. Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha was the Kohen Gadol. And he had a son and a daughter. Who were exceedingly handsome. They ended up being captured by two different Romans. Two wealthy Romans brought them on a slave market. Amru, they at some point, they were friends, they got together, and each one was boasting about his slave, how beautiful his and the, 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 the his and the her, the male and the female slave. So they said, okay, let's throw them together. Let's, let's have them make babies. And they says, bevladis. then we'll divide, because if they're so handsome, it's a beautiful man, beautiful woman, they'll make beautiful babies, and then we'll divide the prophet. So they shoved them into a room together. The son of Rabbi Shmuel Kohen Gadol was sitting in the corner and he was saying, I'm the son of the Kohen Gadol who went lefnayu lefnim into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur and now I'm going to be intimate with a, with, with a maidservant. And she was in the corner crying, I'm the daughter of the Kohen Gadol and I'm going to be violated by a, by a slave. And this is how they spent the whole night, each crouched in a different corner weeping at the lot that had befallen them. Kivan Shaola Hamud The Gemara says, morning, the morning star rose. And a little bit of light began to penetrate the situation. They actually recognized each other. They realized what had almost happened. That a brother and sister had almost ended up in the situation. They fell upon each other. They began to weep uncontrollably. Until they died of broken hearts. That's the story the Gemara says. And the Gemara says, It was for them that Prophet Jeremiah was weeping when he said, Al Ela Ani Bechia. It's for them I weep. Aini Aini Yerdamayim. My eyes, they flow with tears. There's a Medish Echaraba. Medish also about the second base of Migdash. And it tells that Aspisianus Kesa, the Roman Caesar, remember there was purges that happened in waves. Purge after purge, murder after, after mass murder. And, and uh, many young Jewish people taken away, sold in the slave market. Many of them were fed to lions and bears in, in the gladiator. It was horrible things that went on for decades. So Aspisianus Kaiser, who was one of these cruel tyrants, loaded three ships from the young of Yerushalayim. Now, the Gemara talks about the extraordinary nature of the, the young who were raised in Yerushalayim. Brilliant and beautiful, very special people. And they had these three ships of 
of young people, young boys and young girls who were kept separate, and they were being brought, they were being brought for to be sold as sex slaves. How did they know this? So the Mepharshim and the Eich Rabba talk about it. They say because they saw they were not being, mal- they were not suffering malnutrition, they were not being beaten, they were not being treated badly physically. They saw they were trying to preserve the specimens. So they figured out what's going on here. And they realized what, where, they, where they're being sent to. So the Eich Rabba says, that Amdu they, they jumped overboard. They killed themselves. And they said, it is better to die clean than to be sent into a situation of sexual abuse and violation. Yatsa Basko, a heavenly voice rang out, and the heavenly voice said, Al Ela Anibachia. It is for these that I weep. Aini Aini Yardamai. The Gemara over there tells the story in more detail. The Gemara says, first the young girls realized what, what was going to happen to them. And when they realized what they were being taken for, they decided to jump overboard. Then the young boy said, if the girls had that kind of spiritual courage, we should be ashamed of ourselves. And then they, they jumped overboard. And the ships arrived empty. And so, so it seems to me that what, what he's weeping over is, we're weeping over what we lost. Look who these people were. Look, 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 look what kind of values, look what kind of spiritual courage, look what kind of focus they had on life. And we lost all these people. There's a story told of a group of Beis Yaakov girls in, in Warsaw or somewhere in Poland who were herded into a, 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 a very small area. And it was, it was, the story goes 93 girls from ages 14 to 22. And they understood that they were going to be raped by the Nazis. And the story goes, they, they, eat, they ate poison. They all committed suicide. They said, better to die clean than to be violated. It's a story like, like the Gemara. I was once in Nofros, and you know, I always have to film with me. So I bumped into an, an older man that I had met, I don't know, maybe half a dozen times over the last 20 years. And I said, Shalom Aleichem, I said, Shalom Aleichem. I said, you put on film today? He said, I didn't get a chance to. So we put on film right there in the story. And... And he said to me in the saddest voice, he's like, okay, you know, I'll put on film, whatever. He said, Rabbi, why did God make the Holocaust? <laughs> what should I answer? What should I... He says, do you understand who we lost? But I saw he wanted to talk. So I didn't, I didn't respond, didn't answer. He said to me, I want to tell you about my mother who was murdered by the Nazis. He says that we were ghettoized when I was just a boy. I think he was, I don't know, 10 years old or 11 years old when they were first ghettoized. He said, I didn't have milk. We were in ghetto for over almost three years. She said, I didn't have milk for three years. I was malnutrition, and mal- malnutrition. She said, one day, my mother got half a cup of milk. And I saw she had milk. I got so excited. I said, Mama, can I have the milk? And she said, no, my kind. I'm sorry, I can't give it to you. The neighbor has a baby, and the baby's very sick. And as much as I love you, we have to give it to the baby, to the neighbor's baby. And he said to me, do you understand? He said, do you know such people? He said, this was my mother. This is the mother who, 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 who gave birth to me, who raised me until she was killed. Do you understand who we lost? So it seems to me that when we say in this verse, Al-Ela Nibachia, we're not simply saying, you know, we suffered, we were murdered, we were ripped to pieces. You want horror stories? You don't have to go back to the time of the Beis Migdash. You could go watch the eyewitness testimony. Some of these things are even videoed. You can watch the, the Nazis. Yimach Shlom took movies of it. There's enough to rip your heart open if you're looking for something to do on, on Tisha B'Av. But this, there's something much, much more profound here. Al-Ela Ani the Yirmiyo says, it's for these, these, these the Silu Kalabirai, the, the loss of all of our heroes. And then, Lishbar Bachurai, the young defenders of Yerushalayim, the Besulas Bas Yehuda, Al-Ela Ani it's for these. Why? Look how the Pasuk finishes. We'll come back in a moment to the redundancy of Eni Eni. And we'll ask the question why we have to say Yardamayim. We'll come back to that in a moment. But he says, Ki rochak mi meni, ki is because. So it's El Ela. Why El Ela ni bechia? Why am I crying for these? Ki because rochak mi menu menachav meshiv nafshi. Because my comfort is so far away. Because my comfort is so far away, which we'll further interpret in a moment. But because my comfort, which is the presence of Hashem, as the Al-Shech explains so far away, my children are empty. 
What does it mean my children are empty? My children are, are they're, they're, they're forlorn. They don't have the spiritual magnificence of the previous generation. Because Hashem's presence is not with us anymore. Look who we lost and what are we left with. In the words of the Pal Gemayim, he says, Ani He says, he, he, he says I, I, I'm, I'm, why am I crying? So I'm going to come back to the beginning of the Pal Gemayim in a moment. But he says afterwards, he says, Hoyu my children are forlorn, literally empty. What does this mean? Kiloimar, ein mishi alamdim teiro mitzvahs. There's nobody who's learning Torah with them. There's nobody doing mitzvahs with them. That's what I'm crying about. I'm crying about what we lost and what we have today. And the, the Pal Gemayim says, for example, we have this idea that sometimes ha'aretz nikras shemeima. The earth is called forlorn, abandoned. Why? Because ein mila oivda. There's nobody to work with it. He says, nobody work with our kids today, he says. We lost everything. We lost the spiritual level we had, the incredible stamina and the courage. These people were magnificent. And we, that's who we lost. It's al eila ni bechia. Not on the sorrow and the trouble, on the murder, on the pain and suffering alone. Al eila is because who these people were ni bechia. That, says the Novi, is why I'm crying. And so, just to uh, further prove to you that this has to be the pshat, you take a look also, in the Ma'am Loyas brings down two very interesting things. From the Aloin Bachos, he brings down the following. He says, this refers to, Hirachak Mimenu Meshev Nafshi, he says, refers to the time of the first Beis HaMikdash, when the Jewish people were sent into Galut, not in Rome, but in Bavel. How long were we in Bavel? 70 years. And for those 70 years in Bavel, what happened? How did we do in Bavel? Were we tortured? Were we beaten? Were we killed? Most of the killing fields were in Eretz Yisrael. Most of the murder happened before we got to Bavel. Once we got to Bavel, it took some time, we started like to put life together a little. And you know what? Within the first decade, two or three, we got very, very successful. So successful that all of a sudden we weren't the dirty Jews anymore. Now all of a sudden we were the desirable Jews. And there was an epidemic of intermarriage. And says the the Bachas, what happened eventually by the time we got later on, Nasun Nashim Nachrius, our men married out of the faith. We were enough of nothing. And Yirmiyo, take a look, he said, this new generation, the new generation, the maiden Babylon generation. And he took a look at we lost, here's the maiden Israel generation gone, the Sadiqim, and what are we left with? Left with a new generation of Jews who doesn't know what it means to be a Jew. Aleila ni bechia. Furthermore, there's a medrash lekach toiv that says the following: What does it mean? Aleila ni bechia. Aleila ni bechia. He says means the real weeping. Said the medrash lekach toiv is for domam. A quote: Domam shel tzadikim shenishpach ani bechia. I weep for the spilling of righteous blood. Righteous, righteous people, tzaddikim. It's a funny medrash. What's the what, if it's not a righteous person, you know, weep him. Human suffering doesn't touch the heart. Seeing Yidin murdered and killed and ripped to pieces doesn't make us cry. Why only uh, for, for, for Domeshel tzaddikim? He says, because ha'oyshev ha'akovet yesh tashlumen. We the Jewish people, yeah, we're very capable. We can always rebuild the wealth that we lost. We can always have homes again. We can always have real estate again. Look what we did. Look where we came from. They stole everything from us in Europe. Everything was stolen. All the money, all the wealth, everything was taken. Even the Jews in the Sephardic lands who didn't go through a holocaust in, in, in 1945 and 1948 they had to run with nothing on the back. It was pogrom as people were killed. People have nothing on the back. Nobody talks about reparations of the, of, the, of the millions of Jews who were displaced from places they lived in for 22 centuries. Centuries before there was such a thing called Islam. Jews were living in these places. And they had to run away and leave everything behind. He says, okay, this is, you know, Ha'ishiva Kavad, Yeshli Tashlumen. You could re, wealth can always be recreated. Honor can be recreated. These things are not so, are, are not, not impossible. Big deal. You don't weep over that forever. Avaldomashal Tzadikim. But such people, such righteous people, Ain Lem Tashlum. Who are you going to bring instead? Va'alehem. And it's on that loss. Oymir Yimiyahu. Yimiyahu says, Al Eila ni Baikhiya. For them, for them are crying. Kiracha Kemenu Meshav Nafshi. The Medish Lekachte finishes. But what happened? Banish Alchu Bishevi. I have these children who went out into, into captivity. And what am I left with? Hayu Banisha Maimim. 
I'm left with forlorn children. I'm left with a generation that doesn't understand and know what Yiddishkeit's about. Is this not a commentary in our times? You read the stories of, 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 of pre-war Europe, the holiness of the incredible devotion to, 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 to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the righteousness that was available in the streets. And what are we left with? It's not so easy to rebuild that. Not so easy to recreate that holiness. Not so easy to be able to somehow bring back the spiritual magnificence that once we experienced as a people. And that's the Pshat Alela Nibachia. Now, to be sure, it's very clear from the, some of the Mepharshim that there, this is, we are weeping for what we lost. It's not, we, can't, we can't ignore that. The, the Targum says it clearly. The Targum talks about the graphic uh, the things that happened. And, and, and the Tamam Lerava says, yeah, clearly, we're weeping for the murder, for the loss of our youth. There's a story that's brought down in the Medrash that there was a woman whose name was Miriam Basbaisus. And this Miriam Basbaisus was an exceptionally beautiful woman, a very, very fine person. And she was betrothed by the Kohen Gadol, a man whose name was Yeshua ben Gamla. This Yeshua ben Gamla was appointed to be the Kohen Gadol. And the Gemara tells us a story about who she was and the kind of luxury she lived with and like the refined nature. That once she said, I want to go to the base of Migdash on Yom Kippur to see to see my husband, to see him performing the duties of representing Klai Yisrael. It says, they spread tapestries on the floor, her feet shouldn't get dirty. Okay, like, it's not like what happened, it says she shouldn't feel the, the moistness. And then it says, anyway, she felt moistness through the tapestry. It wasn't uh, like Princess and the Pea, you know, like uh, those ten mattresses, she still felt, this, this was the luxury she was used to. And then the Gemara tells a story, Kishemesi Yeshua, the kind of um, the wealth that she had afterwards and the, the, what, what, what the courts awarded her. And the Belazar said, the Belazar of Tzaddik said, I saw, I saw, he said, at the time of the Churban Beis Migdash, that this woman who was so delicate, I saw her hair tied, woven together with a hair of horses, the horses' uh, tails. And she was dragged like that, with the horses of Arabs, from Yerushalayim until Lud. It's like, you can't even, you, 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 can't, you can't even think of it. It's like, it's enough to cry, make you crazy. So he says, Aleila ni bechia. So no question. The, the horrors that our people suffered, and you know, like, for, for a long time we talked about things that happened once upon a time. In our generation, we don't have to talk about once upon a time, unfortunately. Speak to people, some of them are still around. You, you hear the horrors. Stories that are just simply mind-boggling, totally sickening. However, the Jewish side of the story, it's not just the human suffering. It's not just the sorrows. It's for who am I crying what we lost in the time of the Beis HaMikdash. In other words, the Churban wasn't just that we lost a physical Beis HaMikdash. The Churban was the kind of people that were taken from us, the spirit that our nation tragically left behind. So let's go now into the Pasuk itself. This is a little bit of, of background, so you see how the Pasuk is a continuation of the Pasuk before, but it also speaks about, about the, the only way you can understand it properly is if you finish the verse, right? To take verse 16, from the beginning till the end. Ki, because, rachak mimenu menachem meishav nafshi. Okay, so now on to Pshat and the Pasuk itself. The aleila ni bechia is not hard to understand. This is a dirge, this is a lamentation, this is echa. There's going to be crying here, we know that. So, so what's the first thing that demands an explanation? The redundancy. It says, Aini, Aini. My eyes, my eyes. First of all, it doesn't say Ayin, it says Aini. You already have eyes. How many sets of eyes do you have? I know you wear glasses until you have four eyes, but that's like, what does it mean, Aini, Aini? My eyes, my eyes. And it says, Yar Damayim, we're, 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 letting, we're letting tears. Well, some people cry from their ears. Like, where, where else could you cry from? That's where tears come from. Tears come from the eye. And why do we have to say, Aleila Nibichia, and then emphasizing, Aleila Nibichia, I'm weeping. But the weeping eyes are, Aini, Aini, you're the mind. So Rashi says the following, Aini, Aini, when you, you have that redundancy twice, Kiloimar, Tomid, Aina, you're the mind. I'm, I'm continuously, I'm incessantly weeping. I can't stop crying. I can't, people say, just get over it. I can't get over it, he says. I can't, I can't, I can't stop. Kefal Haloshan, the Rashi gives us a very important matrix in biblical understanding and interpretation. When you have a repetition, he says, Malamit Shein Hafugis, that teaches you that there's no stopping. 
This is a continuous. It's what we call incessant. Although, many point out that it's the manner of mekoninim and baychim and sayakim that when you're weeping, lamenting, people repeat things twice. So, for example, we have a pasuk that says, Reishi, Reishi, which is a malachim. It was a young boy who was crying, story with, uh, with uh, Elisha, when he brings the baby back to life. Kid says, Reishi, Reishi, my head, my head. He's, he's kvetching. That's how people kvetch. He's not, that's not even poetic. That's literally a poor child is kvetching. He had a terrible headache. Or it says later in the book of Jeremiah, it says, May I, may I, my innards, my innards, al chalalehim. My innards were coming out on the corpses, on the murder, that I, mass murder I saw. So it, 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 re- reasonably, you could say that when something is repeated more than once, that's, that's a manner of speech, but ra- ra- that's not good enough for Rashi. A manner of, manner of speech is not enough. You can't just rely on poetry. There has to be a message, first of all, in Pshat. Forget the deeper messages. Just in Pshat, there has to be something literal being conveyed because the, 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 the scripture is not just going to revert to prose or to poetry. It has to be telling us something actual. So what are we telling us? Any, any, Rashi says, is this continuation, this constant crying, this, this, this incessant crying. In the Pal Gemayim, he, he says the following. He says that, Ani Baychia, so he says, Baychia Ani al kach Bitmidios. I am always crying about this. This is an ongoing, continuous crying. And he says, very interestingly, he adds something. He says, Lechem Dima says something similar. He says, Ad Shekonisi Lishem, until I got a name. What was my name? My name was, everybody was calling me Baychia. That's what Yerushalayim became known as, the weeping city. The city of weeping. Very interestingly, we know about the, the Kotel is the last remnant we have of the Beis HaMikdash. Of course, it's not the Beis HaMikdash. It's not even the walls of the Beis HaMikdash. It's the retaining wall. It's the retaining wall around the Harabait, which is filled with landfill. And it's not even the actual mountain. But it's the closest, less remnant we have. And in Hebrew, what do we call it? It's called in Hebrew, the secondary name is called Kotel, Kotel Admot, but nobody knows that name. Then it's generally is known as Kotel Amaravi. But very interestingly, in English, it's called the Wailing Wall. It's called the Wailing Wall. But we don't like to talk about Wailing. So we want to talk about Maravi because there's a Medrash that says, Amr Abacha, the Medrash says, Abacha taught, Ein Hashchina Mistalek Mikosla Maravi. The Shechina will never go away from the Western Wall. Why the Western Wall? Because the Beis Migdash was built, it was like an oblong building, a rectangle, and it was built facing east west. And the west side, that's was the Kodesh HaKadoshim. So where was the Shechina? It says Shechina. The matter of the Shechina was on the west side. The building is destroyed. The site remains holy. Exactly where, we don't know. But we know that the Kotel, or the west side, Shechina remains Bimarav. So it's natural to call the wall Kotel Hamaravi because the Medrash tells us the name, the name of Acha, the Eina Shechina, the Shechina doesn't depart from the western wall. So that's actually a Medrashic name. But nonetheless, see, Kotel Admaot is not a known name. But in English, it's called Wailing Wall. And Jerusalem was known as the Weeping City. A city of weeping. Understand the, this itself gives us, tells us that the, the tragic turnaround have from the city of joy, from the city of light, Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, city of gold, we became the city of weeping, city of melancholy. This was the picture, the image of a, of a broken, beaten, destroyed capital, Yerushalayim. That's what people thought of in those days. You want to talk about destroyed? Yerushalayim was the image that came to mind. So we have this idea of Eini Eini, the idea of the continuous nature of the crying, the ongoing crying. The Palgemayim adding that not only was it any any the idea of the continuous crying, but, but, the, but, the, but the crying was something which, which acquired almost a name. And the Lechem Dima adds, Hadmois Yerdes Me'atzman, that the, the, the tears flowed, it was at least it was as if even the eyes didn't even cry the tears. The tears just flowed. And he says, that's why any any Yerdemayim. My eyes are letting down. Water is just falling out of my eyes. That's how bad the crying was. That's how bad the weeping was. They couldn't stop weeping. So we have this, this that now we understand that's the beginning. And then it says, Rochak mi meni menachem meshiv nafshi. Why does it say menachem meshiv nafshi? It could have said, Rochak mi meni, if it's distant from me, meshiv nafshi. Meshiv means to restore. Somebody restores your soul. Rochak mi meshiv nafshi. So we have a Gemara in Sanhedrin, and in, in Mesech Sanhedrin, in Daf Tzadik Chesamet Beis, the Gemara discusses the name of Mashiach. What's Mashiach's name? 
which, of course, this could be a discussion not just of a technical name of Mashiach, but what does Mashiach represent? What's the natural when, you, when a name is the way you refer to something? What is the essence of Mashiach? And the Gemara brings different opinions. Some say Yanai, some say Shiloi, Chanina. And then the Gemara says, Yashayim Nim. There are those who say, Menachem Shemoi. His name is Menachem. What's the proof his name is Menachem? Shanema, because it says, Ki rochak mimeni, he's far away from me. Who's far away? Menachem, Meshiv Nafshi. Menachem, who restores my soul. In other words, Menachem is going to restore my soul. Who is Menachem? Menachem is Mashiach. Interestingly, the name Mashiach spells out four names. Menachem, Shiloh, Yana, Chanina. All four names are spelled out in, in the word Mashiach. The Marsha in, in Psachim, on page five says, Vani Oimer, he says, I, I say that from the four names, Menachem Yishmai, his name will be Menachem. That is the most, that is the name of Mashiach. That's the description of Mashiach. So, Rachak Mimenu Meshav Nafshi means that Mashiach is so far away. And because Mashiach is so far away, what ultimately does this mean? This means that the Jewish people don't have the presence of Hashem with them. And because they don't have the presence of Hashem with them, this is why Banai Shemema. If we had the presence of Hashem, if we had what Mashiach will bring us back, then hey, everything's going to be amazing. But until then, as they say, Nishta Zaypashet. And now at this point in the class, I want to introduce you to the Medrash that creates symmetry between the negative and between the positive, between the good and the bad, which will re-emphasize and reinforce the lessons that we learned. The Eichad Abba says like this, Omar HaKadosh Baruch Yisrael, Almighty God said to Israel, Ilu zachitem, had you merited, hayitem korim batorah, elo moyad Hashem. You would have been calling, these are the festivals of God. That's, that's what the Torah, the Torah describes the festivals. Hashem, asher tikru These are the festivals of God that you will call in their appointed times. Incidentally, then when you say on Yom Tov, Kiddush, that's how we make Kiddush during the day of Yom Tov. We say, Elo Mayade, we say that Pasuk. Elo Zechitim, he said, had you merited, you'd be making Kiddush. You'd be saying, Elo Mayade, these are the festivals of Hashem. Achshav shalo Zechitim, now that you didn't. Hare atem koirim, al eila ani bechia. Because remember, in verse uh, 15, we said, Karu alay moyed. Remember, we talked about the Yom Tif. So from the Yom Tif, we say, Al Eila, instead of Eila moyade, I say, Al Eila ni bechia. Now, the Ma'am Lois interprets this Medrash very uncharacteristically. He says, What's the meaning of this Medrash? He says, Hakavana, the intention of this Medrash is, What does it mean to be calling Eila moyade? Where you make Kiddush every day? Every day becomes a Yom Tif. <laughs> what does that mean? He want to tell me a pasuk that 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 that, that, that accompanies life. All right, you would say elo mayade. It says elo elo ni bechia. The bechia is incessant. The weeping is continuous. Elo mayade is three festivals a year. So how, what's the corollary there between weeping, which is continuous, and a yom tov, which comes from time to time? So the Mam Lai says a more difficult thing. He says kisho hoyu yisrael b'mayla. Once upon a time, we were on a lofty spiritual vantage point. We appreciated the beauty of Torah. And when we appreciated the beauty of Torah, so we get to learn Torah? There was a Yom Tov. It made us happy. It made us joyous. The children didn't run out of Cheder. They ran to the Cheder. They were so excited to study Torah. Ukayoimi says, Shenis Arvu Yisrael Ba'umay, the Jewish people have become mixed into the nations. His Chilulis Asik Bilimud Echel, now we've begun to study all kinds of things. And tragically, Torah has been demoted to an equal, an equal footing with all kinds of other wisdom. If we're lucky, it's an equal footing. If we're unlucky, it's whatever. The main thing, do well in school, kids, and get a good mark so you can go to university. Hebrew studies, I don't really care what you do over there. That's the good ones. That's the, that's the children who will end up in a Jewish school. Then the children of don't end up in a Jewish school. So what are they studying? They're studying whatever they're studying, whatever Canadian can study. And Torah, whatever, if you have some time, you'll study some Torah. That's for Sunday school. That's for uh, when it's not day and it's not night and we're not on vacation and we're not doing anything serious. And then you'll do a little, uh, you know, a little few, sing a few Hebrew jingles or maybe you'll learn your Haftorah and that'll be good enough. Understand the way it was and the way it is. This is, this is the, Ma'am Loya says, this is the comparison. But this reinforces what I said before. 
This da leila ni bechia. A leila ni bechia. He says, yeah, it was to be a elu mayade. A child loved the Torah. He lived with the Torah. Now a leila ni bechia. That's what it was. Now you're lucky if you get a half half Torah. So the, the, instead of ro belimut ha Torah oil, the children see with learning of Torah is an onerous, a yoke. It's like they can you ever see a, a, a ox run and say, please put the yoke on me. Of course not. He has no choice. He puts the yoke on. Now, what happens the moment the yoke is off? He runs off. He's so happy. He's free again. Does not sound like bringing children to Sunday school. The kid's forced to sit there. Now it's not. Now it's a halbet sod. At least they make it interesting. Go back a few gen- two generations ago. They were wrapping their knuckles with, with with the rulers and throwing the pushkas at them and yelling at the kids. I have a whole generation of Jews who hate Torah mitzvahs. Why? Because this was their Torah. They were they were forced into it. This is not just from thousands of years ago. This is like, <laughs> this is like our time. That once the child growing up in a shtetl, what was his life? You know, the lullaby that mother would sing the child to sleep with, Rajikas and Mandlin. It's a it's beautiful Yiddish lullaby. The Torah is the best of That's how a child was raised. He wasn't raised with Xbox and, face, Xbox and Facebook. And then, and then, and then was he raised with Torah is the best of Torah. He's raised with his mother singing to him that there's all kinds of sweet things in the world, but the Torah is the most beautiful thing. And a child could study Torah, that was his greatest joy in life. And Nebuch now, the child, you have to force him, that you're prodding him like, like, like an ox. You have to stick him into the Hebrew school and the kid can't wait till it's over and then yippee, it's finished. Thank God the yoke of his bar mitzvah is off. Where are my presents? Let me finish with this business of the, the haftarah that I had to learn and that performance I had to give. It's not a commentary of our times. It's not a, this is a leila ni bechia. This is a problem. This is, so this is where we are today. Instead of Elam Ayadeh, he says. Instead of the Yom Tif of Torah. Mam Loi says, look where we ended up. We ended up with, with a, a Leila Ani Bechia. However, however, Davar Acher, there's another Medrash. The Medrash says, Afal Pi Shekil and Yirmiyo Ba'alaf Beis, even though Yirmiyo, he gave us, he unloaded on us, and it was in the letters of the Aleph Beis. Of course, this is following the letters of the Aleph Beis. Now, we're up to uh, Ayin, a Leila Ani Bechia. Verse, verse uh, 16, 16th letter of the Aleph Beis. His afilo hachi hikdim Yeshayahu provided solace and healing for all of these quote-unquote curses of Yirmiyahu. Yirmiyahu amar aleila ni bechia. Yirmiyahu said, this is, for these I weep, eini eini yordamayim, a lot of ayans over here, right? However, Yeshayahu, the prophet of redemption said, ki ayin ba'ayin yiru, we will see Hashem, but when we'll, we'll see Hashem when Mashiach will come, will be ayin ba'ayin. Euphemistically, obviously. Eye to eye. Whenever we refer to Hashem, we're using anthropomorphisms. But eye to eye. That's, that, that, that is our future. Ayin ba'ayin yiru, we'll see Hashem eye to eye. B'shuv Hashem, when Hashem will emit Hashem, restore us and bring us back home to Yerushalayim and rebuild for us the third Beis HaMikdash. So yes, there's a lot to weep about. There's a lot we lost. However, the question is what we do now. Our eye has to be looking forward to redemption. We have to be able to pull ourselves away from al Ela ni bechia, and we have to instead move into ayin ba'ayin yiru. We have to begin to yearn and hope for Mashiach. You know, there's a famous, a famous verse from the Alter Rebbe. Somebody said, when Mashiach will come? He said, when people want him. He said, what do you mean everybody wants Mashiach? He says, the Mashiach everybody wants is never coming. The Mashiach who's coming, nobody wants. <laughs> What's Mashiach for people? People that have a problem with their health, they say, oi, the Bani Shalom, we need Mashiach. But they're not asking for Mashiach. They're asking just for the magic pill to get healthy. Right? They have problems, issues in the family. They say, oh, you need Mashiach. They're not really asking for Mashiach. They want a solution to their problem. Somebody has no parnasa. Oh, you need Mashiach. He hears his anti-Semitism. People being hurt. A fellow Jew is killed. His heart goes out. Oh, you Mosai. I need Mashiach. No, you don't want Mashiach. You just want to be able to live in peace. My dear friends, that's not Mashiach. Mashiach is ayin bayin yiru. Mashiach is we see Hashem face to face to face. Mashiach is we experience the vivacity and the beauty and the magnificence of spiritual connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, That the glory of Hashem is known. That the glory of Hashem spills forth in the scene. That the world becomes transparent as it were. No longer conceals the reality of, of, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's presence. But instead reflects and reveals it. That's the problem. This is the issue. So we have to be able to wean ourselves off the Alela Ani Bechia and to understand that the purpose is that we shouldn't make peace with the situation. Instead, we should yearn for the coming of Mashiach. You see, many people think that these three weeks are about misery. You have to be miserable for three weeks, and then after three weeks you can go be happy-go-lucky again. Now what exactly is the point? 
What do you think? Hashem delights in miserable Jews? He, he, he enjoys your sadness? He has nachas because you're miserable? Why? Why would Hashem have nachas from that? It says, if du Hashem besimcha. It doesn't say, if du Hashem besimcha chutz, for, except for three weeks. If du Hashem besimcha always. And it says that all the problems happen. Because we didn't serve God with joy and with gladness of heart. And the Arizal says not only we didn't serve God when we could have with gladness of heart, but because when we were supposed to serve Hashem, even when we served Him, we didn't serve Him with joy. We served Him like a burden. You have to serve Hashem with joy. If you don't serve Hashem with joy, you're never going to serve Hashem properly. Anything you do unjoyously and unwillingly is not done fully. So what's the point of these three weeks? What's the point of Alela and Ibechia? The point is we shouldn't make peace with the reality of today. There comes, we can't walk around going crazy every single day of the year, but for three weeks at least we lost the Beis HaMikdash. The Bein HaMetzarim, during this time in between, at least we can stop and think what was in order that. We should daven, yearn, crave, and hope that it will be again. The whole point of this time is not to be miserable. The whole point of this time is we should see what we're missing. That a yid should say ad masay with a emes. That a yid should call out to Hashem, and he wants to experience geula. That's the idea of these three weeks. There's a, a story told about a fellow who was going to uh, the Lubavitch Shul in the in the area, but he said the story goes it was in Muncie, New York. I don't know if it's true, but uh, the story is a story. He said he went to Lubavitch for originally he started going there for Simchas because it was most fair like Simchas and then he started going for other Yom Tevim, and all the Yom Tevim he liked in the Lubavitch Shul. But one Yom Tov he didn't really like was Tisha B'av. Because it wasn't really so miserable and nobody was really going around crying. And he felt it wasn't, they didn't observe properly. So he would go to Lubavitch Shul, all the Yom Tov, but Tisha B'av, he would go to the local Litvish Shul. And then one year everything changed. What happened? At the end of a whole 12, 24 hours of misery and mourning and sadness and incessant crying and weeping, the rabbi got up and he said, Okay, Baruch Hashem, will be able to do this again next year. He said, ouch. You mean this is about doing this again next year? I'm out of here, he said. <laughs> and I got, like I, I, I told you, I think, uh, at the last class, the story of the Ruzhin Rebbe, the Rizal Ruzhin came to Shul, and the Hasidim didn't like this, you know, make, let, let's make ourselves miserable. Right? And they hoisted him up in the last story. I told you last week the story. And they, they, they realized it was the Rebbe they pulled up. And he really felt the sadness. Like he, he, he was missing the Beis HaMikdash. What did he say? He raised his eyes heavenward. He says, Rebbein Shalelam. The Yidin, they don't know how to take care of this Yom Tov. Take it back. Okay? The idea, we, we observe Tisha B'av, Not because we're excited about observing Tisha B'av. The observance of Tisha B'av is that we shouldn't observe it anymore. That has to be the observance. And that's what the Rebbe told us for over, over, over 40 years ago already. That what should we focus on during this time? We should focus on learning about the Beis HaMikdash. We should focus about yearning for Mashiach. That's the focus of these three weeks. Of course, if you don't think anything's missing, why should you want it? If life is about two-car garages and life is about barbecues and fun, why should you want Mashiach? Maybe he'll take those away from us. You know? <laughs> There's a humorous story they tell. It's not so humorous, but that there was a man who invested a lot of money in his farm and he painted the barn red and, then, and, and he bought new geese and new ducks and new chickens. And he, he, they, whole, they put, invested all the money. They bet the whole farm on the farm. And then he came home one day from, from, uh, from Shul and he was very despondent. And his wife said, what are you, why are you so despondent? It's Yom Tov today. He said, aye, the rabbi's sermon was terrible. I said, what did he speak about? He said, he's speaking about Mashiach and so Mashiach's coming and we're gonna, all going to leave here and go to Israel. So she said, what's wrong with that? He said, what are you talking about? We just invested every uh, penny we have in this farm. We just painted the barn. We just bought the new sheep. And then we're going to go to Mashiach? We'll go to Israel? So his wife, wife said, Tevye, she said, don't worry. The same God that saved us from the Cossacks, he will save us from the Mashiach too. <laughs> <laughs> it's an awful story. But it's, but it's tragically true. How many people think, Rabbi, if Mashiach comes, could I still keep my, my fun? Can I... And I don't want this when Mashiach comes. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I want him. There was one rabbi who wrote an article a few years ago. Terrible article. He said, it says in the Gemara that in the days before Mashiach, things will be very bad. I hope Mashiach doesn't come in my times. <laughs> Can you imagine? A person writes this in a, in a magazine, somebody showed it to me. I, read, I hope Mashiach doesn't come in my time because it says that the days before Mashiach will be terrible. This is crazy. If, if you follow along in your davening, if you, if you, if you, if you daven three times a day and you do berchat you ask for Mashiach more than 80 times a day. 
The problem is saying words. That's Tzemach David Avdecha, pass the ketchup. It's like, it's like you just said, you, God should accelerate the arrival, the growth of, of, of Tzemach David Avdecha of Mashiach. Uvnei Yerushalayim. It's not the words you're supposed to say. It's supposed to mean these things. We're supposed to yearn for the presence of Hashem. Oh, so then you take a look. What, what, what are we mourning for? We're mourning for, 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 for real estate, for wealth, for fun, for power, for fame. What are you mourning for? What do you, what do you, do? you don't have to mourn for that? That can be replaced. The people were able to live on a higher level, at a higher level of consciousness. They lived in the time of the Beis Amigdash. They saw and felt the presence of Hashem. We don't have that. That's not replaceable. We're forlorn today. We don't have that, that closeness to Hashem they had. Oh, and that's what we should be looking for. We should be trying to go from a to a hope and a yearning and a desire for the concept of ayin ba'ayin yiru. The Lechem Dima has an extraordinary commentary on this Pasuk. He tells the most beautiful, touching story to explain to us the deeper message, what does this verse really mean? And I'm going to read it to you almost verbatim. He says, there was a wealthy man who had an only daughter. And this daughter was beautiful in, 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 in body and in spirit, in every way, the most extraordinary, wonderful woman, young girl. And she didn't want to get married just to anybody, and he didn't want to marry her off just to anybody. They're waiting for the perfect guy, Prince Charming. Tzugizot. And so they waited and waited, and she prayed and wept and cried to Hashem, find me the right shidduch. And so indeed her prayers were accepted, and one day Prince Charming arrived. A young man with incredible virtues and everything one could hope for in a chasen. A perfect shidduch for this beautiful young girl, a beautiful young boy. Okay? was a shidduch, and this boy was very talented. He's very talented. And he had tools that he used for his, for his craft. So they got married, and they settled in, and he was using his tools that were able to produce the very valuable things. doesn't say what it would be, you know. Use your imagination. He was a painter, he was a gem cutter, whatever it was. And then what happened is, one day a terrible thing unfolded. There was people who were jealous, and they framed him, and he had to leave town. And the wife said, you leave town. We just got married. Just, just getting to know you. We're going to leave. You're going away, running. Who knows if I ever see you again? And she couldn't be comforted. And he said, I swear I'm going to come back for you. Don't worry. I swear I'm coming back. And she, she couldn't be comforted. So finally he said, look, I'm leaving all my tools. This is my whole life. I, I, I developed a skill. I'm leaving my tools here with you. I'm leaving here in the house. You have my, my collateral. I'll be back. So without my tools, I can't do anything. So she said, fine. Fine, she knew he would come back. What happened? Years go by, the husband is gone, she doesn't hear from him, it's not the age of Twitter or Facebook, no, no cell phone, right? No, no communication. And finally, she meets a fellow, and he comes from this faraway place, and turns out he knows her husband. So she says to him, when is he coming back? And, and he says to her, nah, I don't think he's coming back. He's got a new life going, I don't think he's coming back. She's <laughs> What do you mean? He, le- he left his tools here. He can't, he can't pick up where he started. He needs his tools. These are very, very valuable. He can't get these tools anywhere else. And the, and the man looked at her sadly and he said, unfortunately, I'm sorry to tell you, your husband has found a new, a new career. He's gone, he's gone into other things now. And then she was heartbroken. Then she began to wail and weep because still that she had hope. And they said, now I'm really left alone. And the Lechem Dimo says, this is the story of Eretz Yisrael and the Jewish people a beautiful land, a very special land. And the very special land said, I, I want my husband. I want, I want to have the right shidduch. And uh, nations came and were built, beginning of creation, and then there's a flood, and afterwards nations were established, and there's one piece of land that did not have a permanent nation. It wasn't really, it's called land of Canaan, 31 kings owned different estates. There was Canaanite nations there. It wasn't, there wasn't she wasn't happy. And then Eretz Yisrael got introduced to her chassan. Who's her chassan? Am Yisrael. And there was a great wedding. And finally they built a marital home. What's that called? The Beis HaMikdash. What's the tools? The tools, he says, are Midas Tevis, fine character traits. The ability to have Hatzlacha, the success in the study of Torah. To fulfill mitzvahs in the most beautiful way. To experience Ahavas Hashem, a real love for Hashem, in a way of holiness and purity. To be able to have the deepest intuition and have the highest level of wisdom 
and nevuah and prophecy and Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And the husband is chased away. And the young girl, Eretz Yisrael, said, how do I know my husband will come back to me? How do I know he'll come back? And he said, I'm leaving you all these things. I'm leaving the Torah, the mitzvahs, all these wonderful kalim. He said, Yid can't do study Torah the same way outside of Eretz Yisrael. And Yid can't perform mitzvahs the same way outside of Eretz Yisrael. And there is no prophecy outside of Eretz Yisrael. All these things I'm leaving in Eretz Yisrael, don't worry. And what happened? What happened is, and then we came, we came to Bavel. What's the first thing we said? I lose my ability to make music. It's a euphemism. I left my kalim. I left everything in Israel. I can't make music here. I'm always, I have to go back home. And what happened? And what happened? What happened was Yerushalayim was comforted. And then Yerushalayim heard that the children don't want to come back anymore. Why don't they want to come back? They, have, they found a new career. They replaced, they replaced the Yerushalayim of old. They replaced their yearning and their craving for spirituality. Instead, they're involved in other things. And so Yerushalayim cries, Now I'm taka forlorn. He says, Now Yerushalayim says, I'm weeping. Because the Mashiach is so far away. And only this will only come back when the Mashiach comes. And how you bonai shememim. My children are forlorn. They're emptied. Like, like, there's an emptiness about them. They don't have the holiness. Because the enemy overcame them. There's a, there's a beautiful medrash that says, B'nai Yisrael noisen. The Jewish people, it says, Jewish women are all beautiful. I ah, see some Jewish women are not beautiful. It says, noisen. They are beautiful. El shahagolos menavlosen. It's the exile that disfigured them. In other words, what does this really mean? Was if somebody's beautiful physically or not? Who cares about that? Why, why is that even that issue? Beauty, charisma, it's nothing. It's a euphemism. It means that every neshama, every yid is beautiful. Every yid is a beautiful yid. Every neshama is a beautiful neshama. I, we know neshamas that are not beautiful. We know neshamas that are not inspired. We know yidin who don't care. So really they do. So why don't they? Hagolos men avlosan. The spirituality is disfigured, is taken away because of the golos. It's the golos is the problem. Understand? The golos is the issue. And this, this is the menachig rochak mimenu, menachem meshav nafshi. That the Mashiach is so far away, we're so empty. We don't have what we used to have. We're not even yearning for what we used to have anymore. And this is the nature of, this is why Yerushalayim weeps. And like it says, he says, there's a pasuk that says, Evan mikir tizak, the cup is, Evan mikir tizak, I forget the rest of the pasuk. It means a stone will cry out from the wall and a timber will, will cry out when Mashiach will come, right? So it says like the, it's like the walls of Yerushalayim themselves are weeping. It's like, it's Evan Mikir. The walls itself are crying, where, where are my children? Where, where are the Jewish people who used to live over here? Where are the people who used to be looking for spirituality and holiness? Who, who came to me because they could find communion, oneness and closeness with Hashem in Eretz Yisrael like nowhere else. Where is that? And that's the Pshat of the Pasuk. So now, Aleila Ni now we understand this is not just a verse that talks about suffering, it talks about sorrow, talks about pain and difficulty. This is a verse that talks all really about spirituality. It talks really about holiness. And the al Sheikh, and there's a beautiful commentary, he delves into this Pasuk, and that's basically the message he says. He says that tzaddikim, the righteous, the righteous Jewish people understand the true message of this Pasuk. He said the simple people, they missed the point. They think we're weeping and crying because people suffered, because we lost nationhood. They don't understand the point. We're crying because we lost Menachem Meshav Nafshi. We lost the presence of Hashem amongst us. The presence of Hashem is far from us. And so, this Pasuk should inspire us. It should inspire us what, what we should be crying for, what we should be yearning for, what we should be looking for. And when Yidin will look for the right thing and yearn for what you're supposed to yearn for, then hopefully Mashiach will not be Rochak Mimeni, won't be very far anymore. And in our days in Merz Hashem will be Zoycha for the coming of Mashiach and the Meshiv Nafshi, the restoration of the spirituality of the Jewish people in the third base of Migdash, Bemheira, will be a Amen.